All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you all here. So you are at the Linux in Practice Course 1. If you do not want to go to Linux in Practice Course 1, you are at, you are at the wrong place. I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, to begin with, I would like to go to the feedback you gave me from my last course, which was the Introduction to Linux course. Now, there has been an entire page of feedback. There's just a few points I want to point out. Um, first of all, I have to thank you, all these who wrote so many nice things. So uh, it really warms my heart. I mean, uh, there's a lot of, uh, lot of great feedback which encourages and also good, uh, good advice how to go further. Um, the following I would like to to point out. Uh, the first is learn how to pronounce develop and its derivatives. I'm so sorry. I know I, I'm, I, learned it, I learned it in French first, uh, so I said develop instead of develop. If I say it wrong again, please just yell at me, okay? And then um, there is do you know what FU stands for in the real world? Actually, I do. Um, it's just in Linux, there are many weird abbreviations, so you better get used to them. FU for me means fast update on this machine. BS means uh, block size, yes means repeat something, more means get me some text, and less means get me some text as well, etc. You get used to it in about uh, two hours, you will see the world might change for you, actually. And someone said, I like the penguin. Whoever said that, you rock. You understood everything you need to know about Linux. And then finally, there is a thanks for help. Please stop comparing OS with religion. Uh, so I would like to talk to that person later on because I'm afraid that I might have heard some feelings. There might be something deeper in it. If there is so, please come to me at the end of the course and explain to me what is wrong with religion because I'm not a very religious person, so I'm afraid I hurt feelings sometimes. Just tell me, okay? So it won't happen again. And then there was a lot of feedbacks about give us more content, give us longer, uh, longer presentation, more details, etc. Um, I would like to point out one thing. I am not a professor, and this is most certainly not a lecture. Actually, I am a random student, I'm just a random dude who's doing that because I like to, and I, don't ha I do not have any competences. So this, even though there's a lot of people sitting in a lecture hall, is not a lecture, but it's more an interactive exchange where I'm telling you what I'm very enthusiastic about, and you are actually learning from that. So you don't have to think that you have to just take notes, board like you do usually, but this is really highly interactive. So I really depend on your feedback. If I get a lot of questions from you, that means go more into detail. If I don't get anything back from you, I will just assume it has been boring, and then I will skip this and just uh, move on to the next topic. So the topic is way too large to cover. If you want to cover broad things, don't ask questions, then we move on and get a lot of things done. And if you want to cover deep things, like more in detail, just uh, question me until I have uh, succeeded giving the amount of detail you want, okay? I know there's a lot of people in here, you might be scared, might be shy to lift up your hand. Don't worry, I'm just as scared as you are. I have uh, not much experience with that either. So don't be afraid, we're all in the same boat. So that's about it. Yeah, um, by the way, who got a working Linux in the install events? Wow. All right. Um, who, was a who had a failed installation? Who could we not install Linux on? Wow, that's a rate of 0.90%. I'm quite happy with that. We had about 120 machines that we saw on uh, that particular day, uh, on these two days. So for this course, uh, it's going to be based on this script. Um, if you want to... Oh, uh, let me just mirror my screen. Or, well, let, let me look at this way, so I don't, I don't have to look at you all the time. <laughs> the problem is that... Um, <laughs> no, it's because I, the problem is that this screen is off, uh, and I would have uh, counted on that one. So, let's see. Um, there's our website, which is linux.thealternative.ch. And if you go to that website, you will find down more down here the course script I uploaded a few minutes ago it's brand new and it's not finished yet in the sense of there might be errors in it and this is something we always keep progressing on the thing is about two two years old so if you see something send us a feedback immediately and we will fix that for you okay so what we're gonna start first 
is not about this script, and not what is Linux desktop environments are installing a Linux distro, because you already know that. Um, we assume that you have been to our courses, which we have done before. We're going to start immediately with the console. Right? Anybody any questions about the graphical user interface? So let's dive into the console. Um, let me just open up a console for you and point out some important things. Oh, this is too high for me to reach. So this is what you get when you see a console. It's a big window. And would you, everybody knows how to enter the console, right? Just start up the launcher, type in console. And KDE, you have to type it with a K. And you're going you're gonna to have it right away. So on a console, you see several things. This is your name, which is just the username you have in your Linux machine. Then comes the add symbol as a separator. Then the name of your machine, which is here Linux PMCQ, and a double point. And then now in OpenSUSE, it's a little different. Instead of having a dollar sign like in an Ubuntu system, it has uh, this kind of sign. And this is the location where you are currently at. The tilde, it just means you're at your home folder. Tilde means home. So you can feel at home when you see that. And this is important because unlike a file manager where you get to have a bar, etc., in the console, or the only indication you get for this uh, location is the tilde itself. So how do we navigate? First of all, you have to type. Now, there are different ways to get to type. One is this. It's just a window. It's called a terminal. This is uh, in a graphical user environment. There is a sub-window with a console in it. And then in that, you have a shell. Now, shell is the program that actually reads your input and reacts to it. So it might be starting programs. Uh, it might be doing some weird things, whatever, like chaining things. You will learn that. Or piping stuff. And then uh, there is there was as well the TTY. Now, the TTY is, a, is an environment that is text only. That's like when you don't have a graphic user interface, all you get is a console. And if you press, sorry, if you press Control Alt F1, you will switch into TTY. You can try that on your, on your machines. So, are you scared? How do you get back? It doesn't work? Try Control Alt F2 then. Control Alt F2. And if you have a Mac, I have no clue what the key combination is. <laughs> and then those, who of you get to, to a black window now? Yes? OK, so it's working. Um, actually, you can come back with a Control Alt F7. Should bring you back to the graphical part. If your graphical part crashes, uh, this will help you getting still some kind of interface you can deal with, either to kill the graphical part or to reboot your system. This is like when something really, really badly fails. Oh, that's, that's your way to go. Usually, you don't need that. It, it usually happens in bad ways when you have to, need, when you have to use it. So what we do is we're going to work in terminals. Uh, on my place, I can press F11 uh, to maximize this terminal. Unfortunately, we have cut to the left exactly one symbol and um, have not figured out a, a way to, to fix that. So um, you have to guess what the first letter is. I will tell you if it's important. Um, yeah. Now the shell. The shell is what I told you what interprets your commands. Now there are different shells. This is bash. On Ubuntu there is dash, which is exactly like bash, but the Ubuntu version is a different dev developer behind it. And now, um, you also have fish. Fish is, for example, what I use. It's called the friendly interactive shell. Uh, it has a little bit different ways of interacting. For example, if you type help, it will get you a browser window open, which explains you uh, how to use it, etc. There is uh, ZSH uh, and many, many more shells that you can use. Um, you don't have to explore them all today. There are many of them. Um, no, most important thing is that if you don't like the way to interact with the console, you might have a look at the other ones. For example, Fish offers more or better autocomplete. While, I, while you type, it already gives you suggestions. But now we're going to focus on Bash, because Bash is uh, pretty much the fact that the standard on, on a Linux machine. Um, now, one thing that will confuse you is that Control-C, Control-V is not working. Uh, Control-C will not copy something, but if you do it, this happens. Uh, this actually kills a command. So I'm going to show you a very first command. It's absolutely useless unless you want to produce a very big file efficiently. Command is yes. And yes, all it does is it repeats over and over and over again uh, a command history, uh, whatever you type. So 
There it goes. It goes, hello, 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 hello. And now you just not, don't see the progress, but because it's, it's already so full that the windows cannot scale anymore and whatever goes to the top is deleted automatically because it would overfill your computer. Uh, I don't know how many thousand hellos are printed per second at this moment. This is all what the command basically does. It's, it's good for an example. Um, this you can later on use to create a big file because you can write all these hellos into a file. It's more for testing. Now, when I want to quit it, I have to control C. So when I press control C, it will stop. This is very important. Control C is your friend. It gets you out of pretty much any bad situation. C stands for cancel. Now, how do we copy? If I want to copy hello into the clipboard, oh, oops, interesting. So um, we can double click it and it has been copied. And then how do we paste it? We can paste it with a middle click. Now, on a typical Linux machine, when you have hardware buttons, pressing both buttons at the same time on HP touchpads is the lower two buttons, will paste it. So this looks like that. Now, maybe you don't like this. Oh, by the way, you can also use Control c to cancel out a command you have already started typing instead of backspacing it. You just press Control c it gets deleted. It will not show up in your history either. Now, what is important is that when you want to copy something, you have to right-click in the console, not in the TTY, though. You can right-click it, and you can say copy. And you can say paste. So right-click will be your friend if you like the usual way. Now, for those who like the keyboard, there's Control-Shift-C. So and let's say I want to copy all this. I say Control-Shift-C and V, and it will copy-paste it, just like we have it over there. Right, any questions to that? That is a very basic interaction. Um, now there is uh, what is called RTFM. Now this time the F does not stand for fast. RTFM means read the manual, right? <laughs> Re read the manual. This is when you post to a forum and you really, really ask a dumb question. Someone really evil might actually say that to you. It's like something that you can Google immediately uh, RTFM is the answer for. Like, how do I copy something in a terminal? You can go Google copy in terminal and you will get immediately what you're looking for. So don't waste your time and somebody else's time to ask these kind of obvious questions in a forum or you will get the answer RTFM. Um, I have a, a mean picture for that. Do you want to see it? <laughs> okay, I try to pick it up. Uh, yeah, that should be working. Let me see if I can maybe lift this up so that I can see actually see what I'm doing. Kind of. So there is. This, now this is, a, this is my real computer. This is a Arch Linux. This is the picture, yes. So this is Arch Linux. is a system that is for more advanced users. And this is the archway, how to use Arch Linux. All right. That works for any kind of Linux, by the way. But you can also ask for help if you want, of course. So um, let's do something more interesting. We can, I can show you um, this. I told you is when you're a normal user. If you become the super user, which is, I believe, like this, it becomes a dash. The dash means that you have user, uh, super user privileges. On Windows users, this is, you know, this big window popping up. Do you want to really execute this as an administrator? Say yes, and then become your super user. And on Linux, um, on, on OpenSUSE Linux, the command su will do so. You become a different user. We're going to look at that in more detail a little bit later. Um, do worry about if there is a dash or if there is just this uh, l larger than symbol, because as a super user, you can mess up your system really bad, because you have the rights to do so. As a normal user, the system protects you kind of uh, from doing that kind of things. Now, um, yes, about RTFM, where is the manual? The manual starts with man. Man does not stand for anything sexistic, but it just, just means manual. So let's say I want to get a manual entry for yes. Yes documentation, there it is. 
Man, yes, will show you what it does. And there it tells you you have options that you can put. Either you can directly uh, match a string, which is mass guess hello, or you can bring in some options. And it will tell you more options. Um, let me just um, full size this. So you can say it is an option help, or you can say version. These options are not very useful, and the man page is rather small. You can navigate in this um, using your arrow keys, like that or using page up, page down. Now, this is a very small man page. Uh, there are huge man pages out there, which can be several books big. Um, and the larger it is, the more happy you are, because the more information you can get from that. And always there will be Google if you don't understand a man page. Some are written in a very friendly way. Some are written really difficult. So you'll find out. Uh, but man is always a good point to start. And as you see, they always come with uh, copyright, see also, or author, etc., etc. Uh, sometimes there are really funny things written in them. Uh, programmers have actually a sense of humor as well. And then how to quit is Q. Press Q on your, on your keyboard. And you will counter that again soon. And then um, everything in the console is case sensitive. So if you type man, it will say it's not right. If you type man, then it will say, what page do you want? So this means you have already reached the command man. But the uh, uh, capital man will not bring you to the man page. It's all case sensitive, right? Well, I guess I don't have to explain to you what case sensitivity is. And also, things in the console usually are not reversible. Once you have accepted something, it will be done and it will have happened, and there is no control Z. Actually, what control Z does, it is instead of control C, control Z pauses a command, so if you hit that, it will not undo anything, and control shift Z won't help you either. If you, do, if you mess up something in the console, it will be permanent, right? Now, there are more complex, well, sort of more complex commands that you can try. Um, for example, let's have a look at, hmm, well, nano. Nano is a text editor. And it's not a graphical text editor like you used it, but it's a, a text-based editor. It looks like this. So, uh, Nano is not, a, it's not installed. Okay, let's look at the package manager first, so that we can install Nano. Um, the package manager you may have figured out is your friend. That's probably what uh, Ros Ms. Roscoe would have said last year. Now, Professor Roscoe has changed his semantics. He would say the package manager loves you. Um, for the package manager, have a look at the page number. Uh, this is 29. It is on my copy. And as you see, there is a figure on it. Uh, which explains it the same thing I've uh, explained to you in, uh, in the introduction course. Um, for those who have not been to that course, uh, let me just uh, give you a very quick overview of that again. So how do you do that? You, there you go. The package manager is a little program which has so-called sources. Oh yes, that would be a great idea, thanks. Uh, how about wall? Yep, there you go. Maybe I should write large as well. So these are our sources. Um, basically, sources are online, but you can also have them on a CD or uh, on a USB key. This is just some kind of abstract thing. And you know that you can get from these sources software. These sources uh, contain so-called packages. And packages are basically uh, little pieces of software. They can be a single software or a bundle of software. And you can install them on your system. And then, for the, as, as there are many, many packages in many different sources, sometimes uh, you have to group them. Uh, that's done in so-called repositories. Uh, repositories are like channels where you get software from. A repository is one of the sources that you can have that contains so and so many packages. And a repo is what you have to deal with when you want concretely to download a package. This is why uh, I'm putting this in a more solid kind of shape. Now, your package manager has a file. And in that file, you have sources declared. And this is kind of a list with different repos. 
And this tells the package manager what server that he can get what packages from and in what version. And package manager, then you can tell it then to install that and to put it down on your system automatically. Or, for example, if there is a newer version available then on your system, the package manager will automatically update it for you. And this considers any program that you have installed with your package manager, which, for example, on the system that I am presenting today, any any, every software that is installed on in it. Okay? Any questions about the theory? All right. So, how does that work in real life? There's a, a huge amount of theory that we put uh, that we put in the script. It will make you more familiar with that. So I want to turn this off and that on. There we go. So your package manager is a, a command actually, and this is called uh, zipper. It's written with a with a Y, like that. And zipper usually needs to be executed as a privileged user. Now you have two ways of doing that. Either you type su and then you type what you want, or there is sudo. Sudo. Do is like, as an administrator, do the following command. So if I say sudo zipper, it will open up uh, a kind of a session as a privileged user, and it will start zipper in that, and when it has terminated, you become the normal user again. And this will only happen within this process, which is zipper. All right? Okay, now there are different things we can do. Uh, now I have to offer you a feature which is called autocomplete on the console. Uh, if you press tap tap on your console, it will show you, well, it will either show you all the possibilities there are, or if there are really many, many, it will ask you if you really want to do so. So this time, it asked me, do you want yes or no to display 109 possibilities? Yes, I do want to. And so these are all, the, everything that I can type now from sudo zipper, that would make sense. Sometimes it works. Uh, if zipper tells, the, tells bash what possibilities there are, but that does not necessarily have to work. Now, zipper is a nice program which helps you out. Some programs don't provide that. And then if it doesn't work, it just shows you the directory content of the current directory. Um, now, what is interesting for us is re ref for refresh. Uh, note that refresh and ref is the same thing. Ref is just a shorthand version for people who don't like to type a lot. Um, then, another thing I want to show you is update, install, and remove. Now, refresh is, you know, remember, you probably remember this file, which is uh, the software sources. They have to be updated. The package manager has to know where, what, what kind of software is there around. So in order to update this file, you can do uh, this command, which is ref. And then you will be prompted the password, of course, as you are doing something as a root. And it downloads the repositories. This time it's 11 repositories in your sources. That means you can get packages from 11 different places. You can add repositories to your system if you want to have more packages available. Um, you have to just be sure that you trust every single one of these repos. Because um, you know, your package manager will trust them automatically. And if someone evil is behind it, then it will, there will be malware installed. That's the difference between uh, Linux security and the Windows security. Windows, where you have every time you download a program, a setup, you have to check if the setup is correct. Linux, you just have to once add the repo. And when you know you can trust the repo, you know that every time you install something from that, package manager will make sure that the, it is actually coming from that repo itself. So now we have refreshed this, and we, are, we have basically checked for updates. It's a more powerful operation that we have done there, but this is the, for you, what this probably corresponds to checking for updates. So now we want to upgrade. We want to actually install these updates. And for this, the command is very simple. It's either update or up. Note that on Ubuntu, uh, the first command for refreshing your repos is sudo apt-get update, and for installing updates is sudo apt-get upgrade. Whereas on OpenSUSE, this is called update. So that's a, that's a different thing. So we want to install updates. It's looking what is different, and it tells me the following packages get actually an update, right? So there's Chromium, there's uh, VirtualBox, Guest Editions, etc. And basically all I have to do is type Y to install it, or as it already says, well, Y is the default option, I just hit enter, and uh, it installs them. So as you see, things are rather fast, 
and it's fully automatic. If you have 200 updates, it will only last a few minutes. Um, yo, I'm a wireless, so it takes a little while. Now let me show you how to install something. Um, there, by the way, you can also, when you double tap, you know, the, the tabulator on your, on your keyboard, um, this will complete something with many options. But if there is only one option left, for example, if you type zip, there is only one command that makes sense, which would be zipper at that time. And so when you type zip, it will automatically, already at the first hit of tap, complete it with the ER that is missing for your, for your command, right? So let's open up a, a new tab, which is uh, on this console, control shift tab, I don't know, you, when you have many different terminals. This is a terminal operation, this has nothing to do with the console itself. So for example, I do sudo zip, I press tab, it doesn't do me anything. So that means there are more options than that. And if I press tap again, you see that I have zipper log, zipper name, rec pref, and zipper refresh, which are all programs that start with that. And if I refine my command and do tap tap again, there's only two more options left. Now if I put a dash, I test tap, at the first hit of tap, it completes with zipper log. That is the autocomplete feature. And your tap key will probably soon be one of the most used keys on your keyboards. It's something that, that you can use a, a lot. So the updates have been installed, and we are quite happy with that. It tells us that we can just uh, look at it again if you want to be sure that everything is fine. Now, as we have no idea what this is about, we just ignore it. Now, let me install Nano, which is a text editor I, tell, I told you before. Zudo, zipper. Now, let's see. E and S, install, tap, tap. Oh, there it is. So the install command actually exists. Happy with that. It, it didn't complete with a space, so that means there's something more. If I double tap again, I see, oh, I could have this as well. I don't know what it is, don't have to know. Zipper has 109 commands, very powerful. So we just want to install. The package we are looking for is nano. So what's happening now, it's looking if in my sources, there is a package called nano. And it tells me, yes, nano is there to be installed, but the problem is, Nano is translated. So in English, that's fine, but many of you maybe have a German-speaking computer, and you probably don't want Nano to be in English, right? Because your system is in German. So Nano Long will contain all the translations that are necessary for your system. And this is a dependency of Nano. So dependencies actually mean that in order to install this, you need to install also that. For example, on Windows, dependencies would be .NET framework. You want to install a program, it tells you, oh, you need first to install .NET, right? Uh, this is dependency. Now, the package manager will take care of these, and it's possible that it installs 200 uh, things in order to get your one big, huge app working, right? So, of course, I'm happy with what it tells me. Automatically selected means this is the stuff you didn't explicitly tell me to install, but I want to install it as well. Um, I'm happy with it, so let's go do this. And Nano is installed. That's how fast it goes. So now we can use Nano. Any questions about the package manager? Yes. So Zipper in Ubuntu is apt-get? Yes, Zipper in Ubuntu is apt-get, but they are different in the sense of they take different commands. There is apt-get update, apt-get upgrade, apt-get install, and apt-get auto-remove. Whereas in Zipper, the command is just zipper remove. Auto-remove, auto yes, like this. All right. Okay, any other questions? Actually, um, this microphone is uh, for questions, but by the time I get it up to you, probably <laughs> the question is already over, so I just turn it off. Anyway, now let's go to Nano. Nano is the text editor I was talking about before. Now I can type it, and it finds it, because we have installed it this time. So Nano is very user-friendly. There are many text editors in the console, Nano is kind of the easiest to start with, I think. Um, some people might disagree. I'm not allowed to say that this is religion, but, you know. So it tells you here the control symbol and then some shortcuts. In order to get help, you press Control G to exit Control X, not Q this time, because in a text editor, when you press Q, you want it to type a Q, not to exit, of course. Um, read file, where is? Where is is very nice. It's a search function. 
cut, uncut, which just brings the line that you have cut back in. Uh, and that's about everything you need in this. There are more commands. You don't, you're probably not very interested in them. So what you can do now is uh, type a, a love letter. So that's it. Um, let me unmaximize that. So we want to save it. Who knows how we can save something in Nano? Everybody. So who lifts up your hand? Yes, sir. Um, you can see in the, in the um, explanation, control O for write out. Thank you, Tibor. He, he already knows it. He's cheating. Oh, that's OK. So I press control O. And he tells me, what do I want for a file name? I don't have, I don't have a file name yet, so I need to name this thing. So let's call it love letter. Um, you can say .txt, but in Linux it's not important what you add to the end usually. They are, uh, Linux tells from a different way to, it's called a magic bit and stuff, um, how, how files are recognized. So the extension is not that important. <coughs> and it says row three lines. That's it. We have just successfully saved a document for the first time in the console. How does that feel? Okay, well, anyway. <laughs> so Sometimes it will tell you permission denied. And that is because you try to write a file either to a place where it cannot be written to or to a place where you don't have to write to write to. So think twice if you really want to write to that place. And if yes, you can, instead of typing the nano, you can type the sudo nano. OK? But as I said, watch out with sudo. There, there are several rules with sudo. For example, you cannot use sudo while you are drunk or do not use sudo while you are tired or stuff like that. Um, yeah, everybody does, everybody messes up their system, so... But the rules would be actually good, good advice. So we have done this, now we can exit, right? How to exit? Tracks, thank you. That's it. Um, actually, uh, Nono does not prompt anything onto the console when it exits, it brings you back where you were. Uh, which is sometimes nice, sometimes less nice, if you want to see what you've just written. You will, you will figure that out. So now can, I can navigate in my file system. And we are talking now about uh, a previous uh, kind of section. Let me just figure out the page number for you. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's what we're going to do now. We have to navigate in, your, in our file system, right? Because we've written it to a file somewhere, somehow. I'm going to show you where, where we put it. So we are at page 15 file and folder operations in the, in the console. So the first thing you have to know is PWD. This does not mean password. This is something that you might be confused with. PWD means where am I? It will tell me home Sandro. Now, how could I have told that I am in this folder? Anybody knows? Yes, yeah, somebody's doing like this, the tilde symbol. Obviously, this means I am home and my home folder is home Sandro. There is no such thing as documents and settings on Linux. It's just the slash home slash your username. And PVD tells us where am I. Now, the second thing is LS. LS stands for list. And all it does is it shows me everything there is. So if I have a, a file manager, it will tell me my, uh, my, con my directory content. LS, this is exactly what it does. And it colors things nicely on this system. Um, blue means it's a folder, and then white means it's a document. And we have our love letter here. Now, how could we tell that our love letter would be put here? Well, actually, when I type nano, it just works in the current directory. And in the console, you're always at some specific place. You can change this. For example, I want now to go to document, documenta. This is change directory. CD is the command that you have to do. Now, of course, I have to start, whoops, and it's gone. Anyway, we have to start with a capital D. If you do D and tap, tap, it will not show you anything because there's no such thing that starts with a D. It starts with a capital D. I go tap, tap, it will tell me, oh, there's an O. You can only type an O, nothing else would make sense there. I tap, tap again, and I have two possibilities, which are documents and downloads. There's the autocomplete feature I was talking about. So I press a K. And now from here on, you know there's just one more way to go, which is Documenta. And he knows that too, auto-completing this for me. 
When I press enter, two things are going to change. The first thing is that I'm not longer going to be in my home directory anymore. The second is the tilde is going to be gone. So what we see now is that it says tilde slash documentum. Now the windows you have a backslash instead of a slash. On Linux and Mac you have a slash. It's a pretty much the same thing. Let's see PVD, where are we? P PW, do you mean? That tells me I'm at home, Sandro Documenta. All right, we have just navigated down into this folder. Any questions about this? Because everything we're going to do now is going to build on top of that. This has to be crystal clear. Everything clear? Good. So let's, let's go back up. Of course, CD is the command. Uh, the problem is that with, uh, with whatever I type here, I can only go down, right? So I want to go back up. And therefore, we, have, we need a new symbol. And the symbol is dot dot. And dot dot need, means whatever is one level higher. This should be clear to you now what it's doing. The tilde is coming back. Documenta is going to vanish. And when you type PVD, we are, t we are again at the main folder. You can chain things. For example, I can go up again. I can do ls. Now I'm in, in home, slash home. This is the, the highest. Slash is always root. That's the highest point to go. It's kind of like the CW backslash on Windows or slash on Mac. And there's no, no higher thing than that. And we are in the subfolder home. If we look ls, now what we have in home, there's only one user on this machine, and his name is Sandro. So now I want to go directly to the documents from this part. So what I can do is cd, Sandro, tab of course. By the way, I can also say just cd and tab it, and there's only one option, so it will automatically tell me Sandro. And documente. And you can see that I don't even have to go through Sandra. I can directly go down to the documenter folder. And the same thing if I want to go up to, I can say cd dot dot slash dot dot. That means on the parent of this, subfolder on the parent of this. And again, I am where I was before. Right? Is that clear to everybody? Then we also have uh, a single dot. Now, this may be confusing. What happened? Can anybody tell me what happened? Yes? Change to the right, I changed to the current directory. Um, you, you can s formulate this more briefly, um, which would just be nothing. Nothing happened. Dot means I am staying where I am. So when I say cd dot slash dot slash dot slash dot, I still stay where I am. This seems absolutely senseless right now, but sometimes you have to say that I want from here, right here and nowhere else, I want to go there. So what do you have to deal, you will, you will understand that probably later. What we have to deal with now is relative file paths, because it's always from where we are right now, somewhere else. And you can, you can exaggerate that. You can go to, let's go again to, be nice if I saw something. So let's go again to the documents folder. Now I can say ls dot dot. And you will see that what ls gives me is this time not the content of the current directory, but the content of the, the upper directory. Because I told it to look at whatever is up from us. And I can also do cd dot dot slash. Now we can go from, from whatever is on top of us. We, we are still in Documenta. Huh? From whatever is on top of us, we can go to something else. For example, Builder. And now I'm the fold Builder. So I did never visit the parent folder. All I did is immediately jumped up and down again. Now, you, maybe you start to get a feel how powerful this kind of thing can be. Because you can jump from anywhere to anywhere if you just know the relative location from that. Now, sometimes you don't want to use relative location. You want a location which is completely, uh, let's say, uh, completely uh, not independent. There we go. Independent from where we are right now. And for that, you need to start with a slash. Slash means from the root. So the command would, for example, look like this. 
change directory to the root. In that root, home, documents. And there it does not matter where I am. At. This is an absolute file path, whereas the above was all relative file paths. OK? Any questions? No questions. Um, I'm a little scared, because so few questions is usually a bad sign. Either who, who is still following? Everybody. Oh, nice. OK, thank you. So you, you're so smart that uh, you're scaring me. That's good. So of course, no, no, you can tell it as well to go dot dot slash tap tap, of course, love letter. Now, what the heck just happened? What is all this kind of stuff? These are hidden files. On Linux, hidden files are preceded with a dot. Whenever a file or a folder uh, starts with a dot, it will be hidden away from you when you type ls. Also, the file manager respects that, and it will not show up. Um, yeah, I will show you in a second how you can, uh, how you can show hidden files as well. Um, wh what are these? Well, there is a lot of uh, configuration files in there. For example, the uh, .kde4 would, for, uh, would define the theme. As you see, I have chosen a darker theme. All this configuration stuff is in these dot .files in there. But you can name a file yourself starting with a dot, and it will be hidden from you, which is neat when you don't want to, need to, to deal with it all the time. So when I press Enter, of course, I'm going to be back uh, to the love letter. Uh, not very interesting anymore. What we're going to do now is we're going to look at ls more precisely. So far, all we have done is either ls itself, which is here, well, oh, I have a to-do. Oh, right, I prepared something for the course and uh, forgot about it. <laughs> Good. Um, so there is a file in there, which is called to-dos, or we can say ls somewhere else. So last time we said this, now let's make the absolute path for that, which will be what again? Can someone tell me the absolute path I have to type instead of dot dot? Tap. Tap? Mm -mm. Problem is, in the root there are more than one folder. Home? Mm -hmm. Now tap. And? Right. Uh, no, actually not. Uh, not documenta, because I'm already in documenta. I want it to go to dot dot, which is one higher, which is just a Sandro. So you saw two ways of using ls. The one is with no so-called arguments, just stand alone the command ls. The other one is with one argument, which is actually what to look at, which can be either an absolute or a relative file path. Now, you can do much, much more with ls. You can give it so-called options. Now, let's look at ls. Um, how, how do I get help for ls? Yes, man ls. Um, what, do I, what do you want? Um, so there's, there are two kinds of pages. I don't know which ones I want, so I just wait, and it brings me to the first one, or I type a number. Now here you see that this man page is much more complete. If I go down, there are many, many, many pages that I have, and this is yet a small man page. With home, by the way, I get all the way up again. Now, as you see, do not ignore entries starting with dot is a dash A. This would answer the questions that you might have had. Why uh, can we not see hidden entries, and how can we display them? It's with a, with a dash A. Now, dash A is a so-called option. Options are what you give to a command in order to change its behavior. Um, this is kind of, instead of saying properties, I want this to be my default, here you just say, for this kind of command that I execute right now, and not in the future, I want it to behave this way. For example, uh, Pretty much obvious example. Uh, let me go up, then I have more to show. This. And this time, it shows me all the hidden files as well. For example, dot Mozilla holds my Firefox history. Um, now, let's go, let's see all the files in the subfolder documenta. We can say ls, everything, documenta. And as you see, I have put the option before the actual argument. The argument is what do I want, the option is how do I want it. And as you see, there are three things that it, no, actually four things that it shows up. Just a little cropped. 
One is dot, dot is part of every folder, dot dot, which is part of every folder as well, except for root. Um, there is a dot directory, um, which is actually something... Which is something an external program created. I suppose it was KDE uh, or Dolphin, bless you. And there is our to-dos file. Uh, this kind of thing, I don't want to know it even exists. And this is why without the dash A, uh, it will not even be there. Um, do you want a break? Who, who wants a break? Our cameraman wants a break. So we have to take a break. I'll see you again at 18.15. All right, everybody ready again? This time I have a screen, so I'm quite happy about that. Um, well, so we were talking about, uh, about commands, using them with arguments and with options. And the option that we used was a single letter option, which is the dash A, which displays all the things that you have, including the hidden files. And now what you're going to see is how you can use options in general. So there, are, as I said, this time we have a one, a single letter option, but there are also options which are multi-letter. And there are conventions for that. Now, know that these are conventions that many Linux programs use them, but many don't. So always read the man page first to be sure that uh, it will behave as, as, is, as you expected. In general, you can say that A, V, H, like this, corresponds to that uh, that exact typing. This means that when you have a single letter option, you precede it with a single dash, and then you just hang them all together. All right? Now, if you have a multi letter option, you have to add two dashes, meaning now this you don't have to interpret as a series of single characters, but look at it as if it is really a word, like this. And if you want to specify more things, you can add a equal sign. And options are separated with spaces. And then at the end, without anything preceding, there is the actual argument. Like that. OK? So if we look at uh, man ls again, let's say I want the first one. You see that instead of typing dash a, I could also have typed dash dash all, which is exactly corresponding. So let's try this out. You see, those are perfectly equivalent. I hope they are because the man page specifies it. So another thing is that you can combine both. So let's say um, we want to color automatically. With color, you can, say, uh, you can say, for example, that you don't want your, color, your directories to be colored uh, with a never flag. Um, actually. Uh, there is a way to search the man page, which is this typing the slash symbol on your keyboard, like that. And now you see on the, you don't see. Now you see, when I type slash on the bottom left, there is a slash appearing. That means now you can type your search string. What I was interested in is color. So you see that it uh, colorizes color. Um, I just go slash enter slash enter, and it will bring me down to this. And this explains me what what color is used for. And it's, uh, it's, of course, self-explaining, as this is the explanation. Um, color equals never or color equals auto is probably the kind of switches that are interesting for you. So if I say ls, it does not colorize it. If I go like this, it does colorize directories. OK? Now I can go like this. Or I can go like that meaning that the order of options in this case is not important. But the man page might specify that the order of options is important. And just read your way through the man page. It will tell you exactly how it, uh, how it accepts commands. So as you see, ls tells you that first it wants options. And these brackets mean that options are optional. You don't have to type them. And then. Afterwards, you, you can specify a file. And this is optional as well. And you remember we have used ls without anything, just ls-a or ls and a file, or ls-a and a file. So we can use all these combinations. And it's very simple, because this is a convention that all man pages, or almost all man pages, will follow 
is that if this is written, it means it's optional. You can do it whatever you want. All right. So that's I think that should be good enough for uh, for general Linux commands, as they are only conventions. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to show you probably uh, what would be interesting. Uh, let's see. We can do oh yeah. Let's look. Let's look at a file. I have written a love letter if you remember. For those who have not been there before, um, I have written a very, very long laugh letter in the first hour, or not. So if you go to with CD, remember, LS tells you a list, what is in the folder. CD, go to change directory. Uh, oh, no, actually, actually, it's right here, sorry. So let's look at laugh letter. We can either type nano in order to open up an editor, but we don't want to write something in it, we just want to look at it. Now, you can go more or less. You can also go cat. Let's go less first. Okay, less is uh, the same command as the man page, I think. But if the difference that it does not display a man page, instead it will actually display whatever you give it as an argument, which is in this case love letter. And you see that this end does it look familiar? Just what you get at the end of a man page. You can also go with slash. You can say this, and it will color it for you. Thank you. So let's do this again. Uh, yeah, tap tap also works with with last. So love letter. I will slash and say uh, dam, and will highlight madam for me. Okay. This is like man is using less for displaying man pages. So less is the command that you can use for. Simply looking at things and searching through them. How, to, how do you quit? Well, the same way as you quit a man page with Q, and you're out. Now, there's also more. If you don't like less, you might like more. What more does, instead of opening up like a window kind of thing and displaying whatever is it in this window, it will just print everything that's written in it and exit immediately. Do you see the difference? Who does not see the difference? Everybody sees it. Okay, so uh, you do not see the difference. Yes. Oh yes. Uh, right. If I say cat love letter, it prints us more um, because cat will shorten when a file is too long. So let's make a long file. Do you remember how you can make a really long file? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, you do. So. I'm going to show you what this means in just a second. Let's, let's put it in documents. You see, I can, I can uh, type tap in the middle of a command. It will automatically complete it for me. So one, two, three, stop. That was way too long. There's an ls. There's a, a uh, L switch, which will show you the sizes, and you see that it's a rather large file. There's also the H, which means human readable. I I'm not explaining this because it's written in a script, it's written in a man page. And you see that within this very short time, we have created 164 megabytes of uh, hello there. So let's look at it with less. Sorry? Oh, okay. Um, let's look at the long file with less. As you can see, I can scroll through that. There are quite a few lines, so let's maybe stop. Then I can more it. Do I really want to more it? Okay. So you see what it's doing here? It's showing me the first part. Now I press enter. And actually, it's crawling down. You just don't see it because it's always the same thing. And I'm hitting enter and enter all the time, so the console gets refreshed maybe 10 times a second, and we're still at 0%. This is how long the file is. Let's quit it there, but you have to know that when you press enter there, it will just keep going. Now we go with Q, and it will get out. There's cat. Uh, should I do that? Yeah. It's printing the entire file before we terminate. What do I do? Control C, yes, that's good. It doesn't. It didn't stop quite immediately. It still had to do some buffering because there was so much in it that the computer was a little bit overloaded. So I think you you have uh, you have seen how to see files in Linux. Um, I'm a less kind of guy. Maybe you're gonna be a more kind of person or a cat kind of person. 
I like cats too, so don't uh, don't yell at me for disliking cats. Um, that is everything you need to know about this. Now let's let's do some really more interesting things. Let's copy files, let's move files, and let's delete files. This is going to be the very first command where you can do some serious damage to your system, so look forward to that. What I want to do is I want to put the long file into a different location, because right now where it is, is in the documents folder. But I want a long file, I want this long file as well in my music folder. So what I say is cp for copy. I say cp long file. Where do I want to put it? Well, one directory above and then in the music. And as you see, there's a slash behind music. If I don't put the slash, it will mean copy it into music. So if you are copying a folder, it will overwrite or try to overwrite the music folder with what you have. Now, the behaviors of that are very different. Sometimes, depending on whatever kind of copy command you use, it will uh, put whatever is on the source, which would in this case be long file, but let's assume it's a folder. It will put the contents of this in there. However, if you put a slash, it will put this, whatever this is, into there. That's a difference. Um, maybe I'm going to illustrate that. Anyway, this is for copying a file. Now it has copied the entire long file into music. Uh, note that this is an SSD. This is why it goes so fast. On a hard disk, it might take a little bit longer. Um, so let's, put, let's make a new folder. Make directory. Uh, I will say folder all the time. Um, this is not correct. It is called a directory on the Linux. Basically, it's the same thing as a folder, but technically not exactly. So if I say folder, I mean directory. So w I want to make a new dir, and I want to call it my favorite folder. And if I go ls, now you can see that there is a new folder, my favorite folder. I can cd into that. As it is the only folder that we have, tab will automatically autocomplete. I can go back out of it. Or I can make a new file. But there's a new command you can learn. It's going fast. It's all written there, so you can forget if you want. That's touch. You want to touch something. Now, all touch does is, it, you know, every file has a timestamp. It tells you, well, this file was last modified on blah, 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 blah. So if I go nano blah, I write something, I save, and I go lsl, you can see that Sandro modified this document last at 18.27. Oh. Um, which is nice, because if I touch it now, it will not show a difference, because it's still 18.27. Uh, so let me explain first. Touch will all only update this timestamp to the current time. It's like you edit the file, but you're not actually changing it. Okay? So when I go touch, blah, the argument, of course, is the file itself. And now, I, uh, now it's 28. Hop, and I go lsl again. You see that the file has been modified on 18.28. By the way, this is on a millisecond precise. It's just that Alice is not showing it. Now, the cool thing about uh, touch is that you can also touch in existing documents. And what has happened is that it has created a new empty document called blah. By the way, you can have a command history by typing up on your console. That way you can scroll through your last commands or down to go down again. And you will see that this file, some file, has exactly zero bytes. All right? This is what touch is used for. Basically, either for syncing something, if you want to force an update, you can put a new timestamp on it or creating a new file. So what I want to do now is I'm uh, going up, and I want to put my favorite folder into, um, what was it, into my music folder. Now, what's going to happen now is it tells me omitting directory, my favorite folder. Uh, this is because CP, if you look at the man page, will not copy directories unless you specifically tell it to do so. That's very nice because if you get a typo and you copy a directory instead of a file, and it's a big directory, like your root directory, then you're in serious trouble. So what we have to do is give it an option slash or, uh, dash r and this time it will copy it so what's happening now as you see i put my favorite folder into music 
I see into because there is a slash in it. If I go enter, I can have a look at LS mu uh, music and you see that my favorite folder is in it. But there's a different thing that I can do. I can say I want whatever is in my favorite folder, everything, with a store. Store is here, means whatever is in there. I want to put it into the music folder as well. Uh, if I go this, you can see that the long file, uh, uh, the blah and the sum file, which were contained in this current folder, have been copied to the music folder. And not actually this folder itself, but its contents. Now, sometimes writing this is equivalent to writing that. This is the same thing as we have done above, with the difference that the final slash is missing. Um, I don't know if it's for CP, I, I think it doesn't apply, but if you're using another command like rsync, um, this behavior of this command is equivalent to the behavior of that command, meaning that whatever is this folder will be put to that folder, which means the contents of the folder in this case. So be careful of where you put your slashes and always follow the man page on the sign clearly. All right, now let's move something. Um, I have had this to-do file and actually want it in images because to-dos are good for images, right? So MV is move. I say to-dos, put it to, to the images folder. And it's gone. So if I go to this images folder, there it is. And what is interesting about this is that MV for copying, f uh, for moving actually folders, directories, it will not need the R switch. So I can say I want to put, uh, where, where do we put the other thing? I think we put it into music. Um, my favorite folder. I want to put this here. And do you see now what the dot is for? Right? Now I'm using the dot because dot means right here. I want to move from somewhere else, I want to pull it to here. And there's no dash R necessary. So a CP command will use the dash R or it will not copy directories, whereas MV does not use the dash R. As you see now, I have my favorite folder in the, in the current folder. So am I going too fast for you? Yes? Okay, do you want me to repeat, uh, to, to give you a little exercise for repeating things? The one with the star you didn't get. Okay, um, the star means everything that has that looks uh, like this. Um, the star is a wild card. Um, let's see. If I say I, I do, I'm doing a new new folder, and I call it subfolder, sub. So I want to copy everything that is in my favorite folder into the sub folder. I can say. Or, or let's say I move it. So I say MV, my favorite folder, store. Store here means everything within that. Now I can actually, uh, maybe, maybe things are going to be more clear for you if I go the Windows style. So I'm going to do a new file in my favorite folder and I'm going to call it text.txt. I'm going to call another one text2 and another one meow. And if you look at this, we can see that my favorite folder contains these five files, being blah, meow.txt, some file, text2.txt, text.txt. So maybe, I hope, I hope this is going to help you if I say, I want to copy everything uh, or move every .txt file in the subfolder. Uh, where is it? In, in my favorite folder, into the subfolder. What I can do now is say, in my favorite folder, star.txt. And star will be replaced by everything that matches it. So any file which says something.txt will be moved into the subfolder. Is it clear what this command does? You can say no. Can you just leave it away? Leave, leave star.txt away? What does it then do? Good question. Let's see. It has, cop it has moved the entire folder. With everything contained 
With everything contained, yes. Okay. Um, this is not clear what, what that means. Uh, that way it would have been clear, but with this it's not clear. This is ambiguous. It could also mean that copy all the, move all the content, but actually it is move what defines what it exactly means. But from a, from a user's perspective, this is kind of ambiguous. So I would never use this kind of syntax because you don't uh, get a feel for what it does. Yep. Yes, um, no, I don't. I don't need an R. So let's say I want to go, I want to copy every file that is in contained in my favorite folder. Um, I can say CP, my favorite folder and everything, or let's say the TXT to here. We are not copying folders. Actually, if it contained folders as well, it would skip the folders and just copy the files. R actually stands for recursive. Recursive means, in this case, go deeper. Copy all the subfolders. Whereas if we omit and CP the R, it will only copy the most shallow, the highest files that it will see. But if there are any folders, it will not copy them. And this is what, the, what this command did. You can compare what it was before to what it is now. All right. Are things clear for you as well now? All right, any other questions? This is probably the most confusing part of the course because there are so many new commands that you have to deal with. But we're gonna, everything we're going to do builds on top of that because it's always, it's always the same thing. This is just the base thinking, and then you're going to be... Once you get that, you can fast forward a lot. So now um, I'm scared for what I'm presenting you now. The command starts with an R and stops with an M, and its name is RM. And this is remove. Now, remove sounds mostly harmless. Uh, it is extraordinarily dangerous. Remove means delete this from the system formatting. Forget about this file ever. Um, you can type this once. It will take maybe a millisecond to execute. And you can spend the rest of your life trying to recover that file and most probably utterly fail at it. Remove is non-reversible. Remove will delete a file permanently, OK? Be very, very, very sure about that. So absolutely make sure that whatever comes now is what you really want. So and I go ls, well, which is it. I want to de delete meow. I go rm meow. And the result is not very spectacular. Meow is gone, as we could expect from a remove command. Now we can say this. What is going to happen? Yeah. No. What, what's going to happen now? Yes. Every txt is gone, and everything is left is my favorite folder. Now I can say this. What is going to happen? It's tricky. Yes. Nothing. Right. It's a directory. It's very smart. Remove will protect you from deleting directories unless you explicitly tell it to do so. Because if you delete a single file, OK, that's fine. If you, do, if you press a star, maybe you have to really do a bad typo for that, as you will never use a star in a file name. But what's the weird thing about Yes, don't, don't ever use a star in a file name. You can, but if you do that, you will have a lot of trouble deleting that file later on, because it will be interpreted as a Y card. Um, yeah, so. Uh, f directories are easier to mess up things because they contain a lot of can contain a lot of important data. So the R will mean delete this directory and everything that is below it. All right, I won't do it right now. What I want to show you is how to safely delete a directory if you're sure that you want to delete it. So I go into the my folder and I see that it contains five files still. I going back up. I say or I'm dear. This is the safe method to delete a directory. And as you see, it will refuse to do so as long as directory is not empty. So I can go. Let's let's make a new an empty directory. mkdir cd to it. As you see, it's empty. We go back up. Or I'm dear, empty. It's gone. But we cannot do that on the my favorite folder. 
and you have to delete every single file in it. This is why I say it's a safe way to delete it. The unsafe way to do it, but the utterly more efficient way to do it, is this. It's gone. Whatever has been in there is all permanently lost. The problem is that here you don't have, as a user, to visit the contents of this first, but you could just delete something without looking at it. Now, rm r you can also use dash rf for force, is the most frequent way to mess up your system, to permanently break your system. Now, you can do something that is even worse than that, which is sudo rm rf. <laughs> yeah, you're laughing. You're gonna do it. I promise you will do this. There's, there's no Linux user who has intensively used Linux for over a year who has not messed up something with rm. This is the most frequent source of error. I'm going to show you my second favorite with which I messed up my system uh, two, uh, six days ago. No, four days ago. I'm <laughs> going to show you on, on Thursday. Um, it's a little more advanced. So watch out if RM, OK? Um, there is a way you can say sudo rm or f slash. Slash, you know, is root. So delete root, which is the highest directory, and everything that is contained, which is everything. Uh huh. No, probably not. Um, Jan? Is there no preserved root on OpenSUSE? Is there, op is there no preserved root on OpenSUSE? I don't think so. You don't think so? Just yeah, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> and the system protected me. So um, it's a virtual machine. There is absolutely nothing on this I don't want to lose. On your system, don't do it, OK? If this machine crashes, I have a second virtual machine. Um, I have already especially uh, prepared for this kind of thing. Um, it will tell you it's dangerous to operate recursively on slash. Use no preserve root to override. So we have done it once, just for fun. And I control C out of it. I, I don't type this on this machine. Um, what is going to happen? We've done it once. It takes about half a minute to complete on an SSD like that. And then st things start slowly to crash. Like your background image goes away, suddenly your terminal style goes away, and then boom, blank screen. And you reboot, and it will say nothing to boot because you have deleted successfully every single file on your hard disk, including your boot partition. Right? If you have mounted some USB keys, if you have plugged in some SD cards, or if you have a, a network device with your home NAS, etc., connected and mounted, it will all be gone as well. It's recursive. It goes into directories. You're, you're laughing. You're laughing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be laughing too someday when I can fix your things. Then you're going to come to me, you're going to tell me, oh, I have lost everything. What should I do? I'm going to tell you nothing. Do you want to talk? Yeah, you have to talk about it. <laughs> so, um, um, yeah, I have not. I have not uh, you destroyed my system using RM. I have to say that. And I can talk because I have the guy with the mic, right? <laughs> rule number two: If rule number one doesn't apply, rule number one applies. Anyway, some of you might have known that. Um, I have showed you all this kind of thing. Um, nano is good. Regular expressions. Regular expressions are very advanced. You can say, I want everything that has uh, from Z to, from C to F, and then comes something with an arbitrary length, and then with that, after that, there is a number, etc. Like the star, which I told you, is replacing any kind of character. You can do very sophisticated things. We have lost over a page on that, and it's very advanced, so... Um, you know, that star that I showed you is star.txt is just a very, very, very basic use of regular expressions. Um, I'm not going to detail more into detail with that. So, sudo. Sudo is, as I told you, something that gives you privileges. Do not be drunk, do not be tired when you use that command. Four days ago, I was using sudo while being tired. I've never used it while I was drunk, probably because I didn't have a computer. Um, Usually you don't need to be sudo. You need sudo only if you have to go out of your home directory. Like if you do serious system changes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I can safely say rmrf uh, slash bin. And it tells me, oh, permission denied. I cannot do anything. Because I, me, as a non-privileged user, I don't have the right to modify things under bin. Now, if there were some files in this, 
which were not protected. Um, I just screwed up a part of my system. We're going to find out about that in the next minutes coming up. As I said, I have a second virtual box, so don't do it on your system. Um, so you can permanent. You, oh, by the way, CD, if you don't give it an argument, it will go back to your home folder. It's just a, a little tiny trick. There are several ways to become root. On OpenSUSE, you can type su. It will ask you a password, and you will become permanently root. Now you have changed your user permanently. You can become, you can go back to what you were before with Control D, which is disconnect. Disconnect closes whatever terminal session you have open. If you do it again, Control D, it closes the terminal because there's nothing more to show. Now there are two ways, two other ways to do sudo. For example, on an Ubuntu system, when you go su, it will ask you your root password, which was randomly generated and no one ever knows it. But there is sudo, which is do something as a privileged user, sudo su. And what is the difference now? Sudo is first going to ask you your password, not your administrator's password, at least on Ubuntu machines, don't know about su's. And then you will be privileged user for executing the next command. The next command being become a privileged user permanently. And what's going to happen is, well, the same thing as just with su, but with the difference that this time you're using your own password. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock, is what she is signaling to me. I hope that is as obvious as to her as everybody, uh, to everybody else in here. Now there's sudo-i, which is an option that you give to sudo. It means become super user again, but this time, uh, first of all, change into your own home folder. As you saw before, it, was, it still remained on home Sandro, which is not tilde because I am root at this point. Now, right now, I am at slash root, which is the home folder of root. Root is the only user who is not in users, uh, in home. His home is slash root, and there is only one root. So, um, yes, sudo dash i will disconnect me after a certain timeout. If I do nothing here, it will do this for me automatically. And sudo also, when I type sudo, let's do sudo ls. Right now it doesn't ask me for a password, but if I wait for a moment, sudo will ask me for a password again. Or if I, st if I close my console, I open it back up, do exactly the same thing as before, it, now it asks me my password. Sudo is about timeouts. Be aware about that when you script. Uh, sudo su is not with a timeout. Su is not with a timeout. Sudo dash i is with a timeout. It's written in here. Um, yes. So now that's about it for sudo. You can customize sudo with uh, sudo v sudo. There's a file which is etc. Uh, this file. I cannot even read from it as a non privileged user. This is what it looks like, and it has a few defaults. Don't ever edit this file as uh, with, with nano. No, don't ever do sudo nano etc suders. If you do so and you make a typo, your sudo will be broken. And for example, in Ubuntu, sudo is the only way to become administrator. So you will not be able to become administrator anymore. So this is why it's important to use, to use this file in a protected environment, which is sudo vsudo. And this command actually will only save if there are no syntax checks. Uh, now, this is not nano anymore. It's vi, which is a different editor, which I am unable to use, uh, which is a shame. I can quit it, though. This is hard. You have to press escape and then column and then Q and then enter. So V is extremely advanced. You can do a lot of things. Um, if you have time, learn it. I haven't had the time. Uh, it's cool. So as you see, vsudo after that v quit will tell us that uh, the, the file has been unchanged, and it has been on a TMP file, which is a copy of it. You actually write a copy, and then the copy will be syntax checked and put back. This is how you, when there's syntax check, it will not allow you to save it, which is nice. All right. Um, there is only one interesting thing that I like about sudo, except for setting it up in order to work with the sudo command. You can do a lot of things there. Well, check the man page. Um, there is a defaults insult, which you can add to the end of your command. Uh, for example, this is my personal system. I have set this up. So when I type sudo ls and I type my password wrong, it will actually start insulting me. 
You can spend hours on that. Um, this is fish, as you see, it's already uh, auto uh, auto typing things for me. Um, as you see, this very uh, I, let me let me float it. So at the very end, you see defaults insults. This little thing will activate the insults. If you want to have fun, you can uh, you can do that. This is a little uh, a little cookie that you get in the program. It's called an Easter egg. Um, yes, this is all I want to tell you for sudo. Um, the next thing is how to start programs. Now, when you have <laughs> when you have programs installed in your computer, they are usually under user bin, USR bin. So let's see what is in there. There's a lot of things in there, right? Um, you can scroll through that. Oh, well, this way you can see it. Let's let's go this. Um, for example, we will find under n uh, a little program that we have installed, which is nano. Uh, well, it's a far way to go. It's actually so far away that my buffer is not long enough to, <laughs> to cache it. There's a lot of programs. All the programs installed in your system, or very most of them, will be found in user bin. And uh, some of them are just links, like apparently the CPP. Uh, some of them are scripts and some of them are actual programs. Many of them are just links, meaning that they point to some different program location. So this is one thing that is probably confusing. There is no such thing as a apps or a folder, applications I think it's called on a Mac, or a program files folder on your Windows. This doesn't exist on, on, a, on a Linux system, but the programs can be anywhere. And then what you just do is you tell your program uh, to look for what you tell your Linux to look for whatever the program name is at a specific place. So um, when I type nano, what it's going to do, it's searching while I press tab. This is, this is, how, this is how fast it goes. It's, uh, the reaction is immediate. It looks for several places in your system, one of them being user bin. So when I do nano, or if I do, this is exactly equivalent. Nano is just a shortcut for user bin nano. Now, how do I know that? Actually, I can say where is. It will tell me that it is here. It is there. And it's there. Now, this is probably the actual implementation of the program. This might just be a link. And that is a uh, man page. User share man is the man page of it. When I type man nano, what it's going to do, this is a, a sort of zip file. It will unzip this and display it through less. That's what it looks like. And this is where this is the file where this is all coming from. Okay? Hopefully you're starting to see how Linux is working. Everything is linked together, tied together in a in a weird way. Um, now let's look. At, oh, there's there's another command than where is. Uh, what, which is the other command than where is? I don't I don't ever use it. Which exactly? You know this where is tells us all the location where it's installed. Which will just tell you if you press nano, where would it go? And nano is just a shortcut for user bin nano. All right. Um, then we're gonna talk about starting programs in a local place. So let's go to let's go to user bin. Imagine that I am not at user <laughs> at user bin, or um, well, I, I'm going to I'm going to copy nano into tilde. I can type this as well. Documents. I'm not sure if that works. I haven't tried it out. So trust me, I'm going to be an engineer someday. So that's a s when I go ls, you see that nano turns up green. That's because nano is executable. It's a program. A uh, program on Linux doesn't have a .x or .app extension. It's just marked by the permission system, which we'll look at in two days, uh, as being a special, uh, special kind of permission, executable. So if I type nano, this will not be executed. Instead, it's going to look in all the folders, you'll find the nano from user bin and will execute it there. But I want this file to be executed from here. Now, does anybody have an idea how I can execute this local executable file? 
It's a tough one. Yeah? Yes, uh, you know Linux then. So we can say dot slash. So from here, start me nano. And here you really need dot slash, as if you just type nano, it will go to the other folder. And it's working. Uh, it looks the same because it's a, it's a copy of the other nano, but this time we are running our local nano. How can you tell if we remove it? Now, rm does, you know, this, this user bin stuff only applies if you type the command and nothing else before it. rm nano is, of course, for the local nano. It will not delete nano from the system. You will see that this is not working anymore. However, if I just type nano, of course, it will still work. Actually, if I uninstall Nano and then have my copy, uh, it will still work. Um, why is that important for you? Maybe later on we will have local programs, like Eclipse is something that you better install not on your system, but in a local home, in your home folder. Then you will use dot slash to start it if you want. Or what you can do is you can create a link in a user bin. Now, um, time is getting short. I'm going to show you one last thing, which is how to link things. And for links, we're going to do ln. I um, don't know if I find this e easily. Um, no, not immediately. Anyway, um, there's not much to know about ln. Most of it is written in the, in the man page. Um, what you need to know about ln is that it takes it can take some options, and it takes the target and the link name. Now, these are not optional. You have to type ln something something, at least. Um, the target is, you all know what a link is, right? Who, who doesn't know what a link is? OK, it's like a shortcut, the LNK thing on, the, on Windows. So target is what we, where, where do we want to get this link from? What does it point to? And then link name is what is it supposed to be called? So let's say, let's assume in my favorite, uh, what, what would we have in there actually? We have some file. So I want to create a link in this folder, which is the documents folder, down to some file. What I do is ln, and then as we saw target, which is my favorite folder, some file, and then the link name. And it's doing it, and you see that I have link to some file. Now I'm going to edit this. I say, hello. I go into my favorite folder. I go look at the file, some file. And it contains the same thing. Is this because it is the same file? This is what is called a hard link. Actually, on your file system, um, the formatting, this is only, uh, the formatting is only pointers to a specific location at the disk where it actually data resides. If you have a lot of time today, so I'm going to show you that. So we all have two file descriptors, or, well, two, two file names for the same file. One file being here and called link to some file, and the other one being in my favorite folder and uh, then some file. And they are actually the same data on the disk. And if I go lsl, you can, uh, well, uh, on my computer, uh, it will now show me the links. So that's, that's interesting. Let's see, ls, I want the first. I'm going to search. I'm going to say link, follow symbolic links. Ah, it's a, it's a, a capital L, I think. It might be, it might be this. So let's try ll. No, it doesn't work. Anyway, I don't have the time to, to specify that. Uh, sorry, f oh no, of course not, because it's a hard link. Hard link is what I, uh, what I told you, is two files going to the same physical uh, location. What you can do as well is a soft link. That goes with ln, I'm going, I'm going back the, to what we had before, which is that ln, I go with dash s. Um, dash s means do a symbolic link. Now this time, it is not going to link to the actual data, but it's going to link to the other pointer to that we have to this file. Usually you will need ln with s, uh, because it's the symbolic kind of thing is what you need for folders, since they don't exist on the actual disk, they just exist in the formatting. If you study computer science, this makes sense for you. If you don't, just use ln always with a dash s and you'll be happy about it. So this time it's called a symlink. 
And you see that symlink shows up in a different color than link to some file. What you do under Windows is always a symlink. So this is what you're used to. That's why I recommend you, if you don't know what you're doing, just do ln-s. Uh, and if I go lsl, now this time it shows up as I expected. It tells me symlink is actually just a symbolic link to some file. And this concludes uh, today's lecture. See you again in two days. If you want, we're going to start exactly from where we stopped. It says advanced, but it's just whatever comes from now. Goodbye. Have a good day. Thank you.